Hello everyone, and welcome to your third Cocoa Concurrency tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about GCD, or Grand Central Dispatch, which is Apple's framework for incorporating concurrency into your applications. And I quite frankly think that it's one of the greatest additions Apple has added to the language, and it's something that uh, many other languages lack for that matter. So what does GCD allow us to do? Well, it really allows us to not think about how we can incorporate threads or where we lock a certain thing. Uh, we can really just think about developing our code as a single thread or a single process and where we need to break up certain chunks to run, maybe on another thread, we can sort of easily incorporate that into uh, the, the, the way Grand Central Dispatch is laid out. So we'll talk about this as we work through it. But um, what I like to think Grand Central Dispatch as is a way that you don't have to think about the concurrency, you really think about your application. So it's, I think it's a very nice framework. And with that said, um, I'm gonna show you basically a bunch of demo stuff. I'm also gonna put all this code on GitHub and you'll probably wanna download this code actually instead of probably trying to type it all in or set up this project, but I'll get into that in just a bit. Let's talk though about lesson one and two because these next few tutorials are gonna take a little hiatus from that and we're switching into Grand Central Dispatch which is really a topic within its own. And But the first two tutorials are important. So what we learned in the first tutorial is we learned about threads and threads are still the main basis behind Grand Central Dispatch. So to recap though, the main important points that we get out of that are that threads to really be beneficial have to run on other cores. Uh, this isn't necessarily the case, but if you wanted to get better performance out of the same task, you would have to run them on multiple cores. So let's say we're doing some work and uh, we want to maybe load a bunch of things, uh, load a bunch of, I don't know, something from disk or uh, do something with each one of these files. And what we're doing is we want to take this file or we want to take all these threads, right? So let's say we spawn four different threads we want to make them run on all the different cores that we have. So if we had, for example, a quad core machine, we could do this work on these four different cores. And the important thing to remember is that a core can only want run one thread at a time. So it's one thread per core. And in this case, if we spawn four threads, theoretically we could run all of these threads on these four cores. Life is good. We maybe got close to a you know 4x performance gain from that, which is pretty cool. Now the downside to this though is let's say we don't have a quad core machine. We still spawn four different threads that are gonna do the same work. And um, now instead of running on four cores, maybe it's only running on a single core. Right? Maybe, or maybe the only access we have on our quad core machine is to a single core. And then this means that all these four threads now have to run on the same core. And so what ends up happening? Well, they can't all run at the same time, and so we have to switch between them, and this is known as context switching. Basically, what ends up happening is we would maybe run thread one, we switch a few you know, nanoseconds later, and then we would switch again to another thread, right? It does a little bit of work, and we switch again, and it does some work, and it keeps switching, and this is not good, right? Why is this not good? Well, because we keep having to do these switches to do the same work. So we actually just made our application worse off than if we just left it as a single core or single threaded implementation. And so we made we just made the performance worse. And not only that, we just complicated the code to you know incorporate concurrency. So we made our code look worse, and we also made our application run worse. So obviously two things that you never want to do in your application. Now, um, that's you know, all nice and good, but why are we talking about this? Well, because GCD is sort of smart at managing this. Grand Central Dispatch really understands the computer and understands what's available to run. What can we really get out of the processor? So what we really tell GCD or Grand Central Dispatch is that here's some code that we're gonna run at some point in time. Please try to allocate this across the cores or across different threads to run appropriately. Try to get the most benefit out of the computer that you can. And it's even more simple than that because we really don't have to, you don't have to say, you know, let's make a new thread for it. We can just say, run this code. And uh, the way that Grand Central Dispatch does this is quite nice. 
Right. The other thing that we can do is if we need to lock a particular section of code right with our incrementing variable that we saw, we uh, can do that as well with Grand Central Dispatch by saying that really only one aspect can access this little component of code at a given time. And so that's another nice thing that Grand Central Dispatch allows us to do. And we'll talk about all this in this tutorial, or at least an introduction to that. So what we have here is uh, two example applications. The one on the left is running without Grand Central Dispatch. So it is a single threaded application. And if I click on this, you'll notice that the button highlights. I'm actually beach balling right now, which you might not be able to see on the screen recorder. But then we get all this animation of all the images that we just loaded down to the bottom of the screen. This is not the effect that I was going for at all. The effect that I was actually going for was to load images from the left to the right and I want this button to fade out as soon as I click it, and I shouldn't get a beach ball, right? If, I, if I'm if i beach balling in my application, this is a serious, seriously bad sign, right? So I click on this, you notice the button fades right away, and as the images are loading in from disk, then they start to animate. So what's happening is, right, as the images start to load, as soon as they are fully loaded, then they will actually animate, which is perfect, right? It's exactly the animation that I wanted. All right, so how can we accomplish this? Well, what we have is sort of the setup code that I'm gonna briefly run through, but again, I suggest you just download it from GitHub because uh, it'll be a lot quicker, but uh, I'm gonna talk about it anyway. So what I have set up, simple window, so this is just a brand new Swift project, nothing special. Um, I've connected this button into my app delegate for an IB action. I've also enabled layer backing on the window itself. So I've selected the, the content view on the window and I go into the effects, uh, effects inspector or something like that, view effects inspector, and you enable the layer, the core animation layer for this window. So that just helps for the animation uh, part that we do on the app, but you don't actually need to add that. You, you can play around with it if you want. All right, so with that, then we have a bunch of other code, which I'm gonna you know, move these guys to the side. So what we have is uh, a simple count variable, and this is actually what I'm using for the offset. I probably could have, probably should have called it offset or something, but nonetheless, it's using uh, this value, and every time I add a new image onto the screen, I'm basically incrementing this count by 10. And so by doing that, I'm actually just moving the, um, I, I'm, I'm able to, to move the images across the screen, right? So every new image is gonna be 10 pixels further than the last, pic the, the last picture. All right, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm, this is my IB action, so when I actually hit that button, I'm going to load in the URL for the library desktop pictures. All right, so what I uh, have there is simply that I'm gonna load this URL, I get the default file manager, and then here I'm going to get every object that's in our uh, URL, so every the object that's in our desktop pictures folder, I'm gonna go through all the pictures and then I want to just basically load them up, right? So what the directory enumerator allows us to do is just go through each of those objects. It's basically just gonna give us a list of all the things in that folder, all right? I'm doing here is just changing the button's alpha value. So this is the button that I click, right, the sender. I just change its alpha value to be zero. That just allows it to hide. The other thing that I have here is an NS image extension which is just like a category in Objective-C, I just added a new function called thumbnail image. And this uh, function or method will generate a thumbnail image. So why do I do this? Well, quite simply, the desktop images are very large, right? They are a full size image. And I do not need a full size image. I really only want a image that's going to be 300 by 200 in my case here. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a blank NS image, which might seem kind of odd to you, but this is essentially an NS image that is empty with a given size. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the actual image that I load from disk into this thumbnail image. So instead of working with the large actual image that we take from disk, I'm gonna generate a small thumbnail, and then I'm gonna return that in this function. All right, so that's uh, pretty much it, and I'll show you where I use that later. But let's go ahead and run this code just so that you get an idea of what we have here. So obviously, not really much is going to happen. Uh, literally, the button is the only thing that you'll notice, so the button will animate out, right? But it's important to notice that nothing is actually stalling in my application. It uh, runs fine, there's no beach balls, etc. So now I'm gonna incorporate the code for running the while loop. So uncomment that. 
And what this code is doing is it's taking every URL in this directory enumerator, so every image basically that's in the desktop pictures folder. This code here is going to skip over any folder that's in this folder. So the point of doing this is that I only want to load image files. And if I tried to initialize an NS image and it only had, or it couldn't be initialized basically, right? So if I, I, ha if I try to load in an image but it's not an image file, then I actually want to skip over that. And so I can do that um, using that. All right, so with that said, um, what I'm doing here is I'm just skipping if I hit a directory, which is what I want. Basically, if it's not a directory, I'm gonna assume it's an image, and then we'll load it in. So from here, all I'm doing is I'm incrementing the count every time I run the while loop, which allows me to meet, for every image, I'm going to move the X position, which as you can see right here, when I make the frame, I'm moving the X position by the count. So for every new image view that I put on screen, it's gonna be 10 pixels or 10 points to the right. All right, then we set the image up on our image view. And I, as you notice, I get the thumbnail image right there. So that's my thumbnail image extension. Um, and the last part is simply to add all this code onto the windows view. So I add the view, the image view is a sub view to our window. And then I simply change the animation duration. So here, this line of code is changing the duration of the animation to four seconds. And then I animate the view so that it will go to the bottom of the screen. And this is just, you know, the self.count again is my X offset and zero is the bottom of the view. All right, so now if I run this, let's check out what happens. So if I run and I click, you'll notice uh, it's still highlighting at beach balls and now eventually my images will animate, right? So this is the version that I had created without any Grand Central Dispatch. So this is all the code you need to get that accomplished. And you might be able to, might be able to simplify this. This is probably really bad code actually to do this uh, section. There probably is a better way to accomplish this. But anyway, aside from that, um, that's what we're, we're doing. So how can we make this so that it will run without blocking our, what's known as main thread? So when your application runs, it's running on the main thread. And the main thread is the thing that takes all of your mouse events, your touch events, um, your you know keyboard events, etc. And then it's also going to run the code that you have. So anything that happens on this thread, right, if I'm running an extensive uh, process and I'm not allowing anything else to happen, right, which is what is happening in this while loop, I'm loading all these images, which takes a very long period of time, then this is known as blocking the main thread. I'm taking, uh, I'm basically saying that I have to keep running this code, but I can only run it on the main thread right now. So anything else that needs to happen is not gonna happen, right? And that's this is why we actually get beach balls, in case you didn't know that in Mac OS. When you get a beach ball, this is, well, there are different cases, but the, the often, uh, or the, the case that happens the most is that you're blocking the main thread because you're trying to do some work on it and so nothing else can happen. We can't get any mouse events or anything like that. All right, so how can we fix, fix this though? Well, we can use obviously Grand Central Dispatch. And the methods are pretty simple. So anytime you really wanna add something, you basically say dispatch async. And we'll talk about another one called dispatch sync in just a bit. But dispatch async is quite simple. We can see that we have a queue parameter which allows us to add some work to a queue and then we add this to a block, all right? And the block is the code, the block of code that we wanna run. So I'm just gonna throw in this block here and uh, we're gonna copy all of our while loop code. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, and I'm gonna just paste it in here. Beautiful, and uh, that's the block of code that I'm going to run. And I'm just gonna delete these parameters at the end because they're just kind of extra noise that I don't need in uh, the application. All right, so uh, in case you didn't actually catch that on what I did with that placeholder, I just selected the placeholder and then hit return. That's how I got that auto completion to happen. All right, now what am I trying to do with this dispatch async call? Well, dispatch async is saying, let's dispatch this block of code and let's throw it on a queue. So that's what we're trying to do. And what's the queue that I want to display this on? Or what do I want to add all this code to? Well, let's talk about that just uh, with some slides. So this little keynote presentation will hopefully help you out with understanding dispatch queues. They're really not hard to understand, but let's run through it. So 
we have this block of work that we want to do, basically the code that we want to run. In this case, that's our, all of our while loop code. And I'm going to add this code onto a queue. And you can think of a queue simply as like a, a line that you're waiting in. So if you're, you know, you go to Chipotle or McDonald's or Subway, some fast food restaurant or, you know, anything that you wait in line for, then you are basically waiting in a queue, right? The first person that gets added onto the queue will be the first person that gets served. And what we have is we're just basically waiting for uh, this queue to start the work. So what we've done is these little blocks of work, aka our code, is added onto the queue. And then the queue is going to dispatch this to a thread. So in this the case that we have a serial dispatch queue, we basically only do one piece of work at a time. And we can keep adding new pieces of work, right? We could add, you know, 100 different things to this dispatch queue, and eventually 100 things will get executed. So the, the queue, again, is just like waiting in line. The queue will offload the work to a thread, and the thread will do the work, and then the cycle sort of continues, right, until the queue has basically served everyone in the line or done all the work. All right, and that's sort of the process for that. The other type of queue is a concurrent dispatch queue. So the first one was a serial, this one is a concurrent dispatch queue. The difference between these two is that the concurrent one can run multiple objects at the same time. So maybe this concurrent uh, queue will, you know, throw uh, the objects onto three different threads in this case, right? Again, the difference being the serial queue can only execute code at, you know, one at a time. So it can really only use one thread at a time. The concurrent queue, though, could use all three of these threads. So I could take three blocks of work off my queue, throw them into a bunch of threads, and now these threads will go to town and try to do some work. So when one of these threads is done, let's say thread two is the first to complete, then the next work or next uh, block of work that's from our or on our concur on our concurrent queue will be added to that thread, and the thread will then try to do that code, right, or do that work, whatever you want to think of it as. All right, so that's the idea of a concurrent dispatch queue, quite simple, but the main difference between the serial and concurrent ones is that serial means you can only run one piece of code that's on the queue at a time. Concurrent means we can run as much as possible, basically. So there's really no sense of order. It's really just, you know, the first person into the queue will be the first person to be dispatched, but it doesn't mean you're the, you know, the only one executing or that you will necessarily finish first. So anyway, that is Concurrent, uh, concurrent dispatch queues. All right, now with that said, let's head back to Xcode and let's figure out what kind of queue we can add this to. And GCD has a bunch of ways that we can use some default queues. And we can get these by saying dispatch underscore get, and we can get a global queue. So there's underscore get global queue, and it takes an identifier, which is an identifier for the queue you wanna get, and then flags, which I usually just say is zero, um, and you pretty much always say it's zero, but for for now, we'll just uh, leave it as zero. We can go in depth on what that uh, f that flag actually means on a later tutorial. But the identifier in this case is the is just saying that we want to identify what queue we want to add it to. And GCD defines, uh, I believe, at least there might be more, but there's four uh, at least concurrent queues that we want to add onto. So these queues are. We can find them by saying dispatch, all in caps, underscore, queue. And you'll notice there's these dispatch queue priority types. And these are the priority queues that we're going to add ourselves onto. Now you'll notice there's four different ones. There's background, default, high, and low. And basically it's quite self-explanatory on what this means. The priority is really how important is this code to run? And usually, if you just want code to run, you will select the default priority queue. That's a fairly common thing to use. If you have some process that could, you know, doesn't really need to complete anytime soon, it's just sort of lazily checking something, uh, you could put it on the background queue, right? It's guaranteed to eventually maybe run, right? But it's not, it's not something that needs to, to be in front of anything else, right? So if there's some other processes that need to execute, the background priority queue is going to be the last thing that ever executes. Uh, another two examples, right, are the high and low priority queues. And this just, uh, again, to explain, is just that if we added something to the high priority queue, that would mean that it's going to get the utmost importance, basically, of these queues. If I added it to the low priority queue, it would be executed later on if there were other things that were maybe on the high priority queue or the default priority queue. 
So that's just these are just different queues that we can add. And we can also create our own queues that we might want to execute things on. So we'll get into that and do another tutorial. But let's go ahead and say the, the priority default queue for this one. All right, and that is it. So we've added that. And uh, the last thing that we uh, actually didn't want to complete that, but this is uh, the code that you're going to end up getting if you uh, just deleted the last little section there. Swift has a way that we can sort of simplify the code by, uh, this is known as uh, trailing closure syntax, where we can actually just finish off the async function like that. But anyway, that's just a sort of a minor detail of uh, how you can use them. All right, so now that we have this anyway, uh, I'm just going to undo these code changes just so uh, I'll leave it as sort of the default way that you might see it. The other uh, thing that we, uh, so let's just go ahead and actually run this as we have it. So what this is doing, right, just to recap, we have our dispatch async call. What dispatch async means is that basically this this code will be executed asynchronously. This means that we are not going to wait until this code is done, which is very important. So um, by just adding this in, basically we're saying, take this code, this block of code, throw it on a priority queue or throw it on a, you know one of these queues that we have, and we're just going to execute this code at a later point. Dispatch async again means we are just going to do this at some later point in time, right? We're just gonna throw it on this queue, but we're going to return right away. And this allows our start image fall function to finish right away, right? Because this block right here isn't actually going to take very long. The dispatch async just takes the code, throws it on a queue, and then it's done. And it'll return just like any other function. Now, the reason, right, that this didn't this, that we were waiting before was because we had to execute this entire while loop before the start image fall function could actually complete. And now we don't have to because we're using dispatch async. And then we just throw the code onto a queue and it'll execute it uh, whenever it gets around to it. So we could try this out. And you'll notice that our button actually disappeared right away, which is a good thing. However, we get a lot of errors. So the errors are happening. And if we scroll up to the top, you'll see that it kind of explains to us that this application is modifying blah, blah, blah from a background thread. And why is this happening? Well, any code that you have to execute that essentially draws anything on screen, you oftentimes have to run this on the main thread. The main thread is usually responsible for actually drawing content on the screen. So you might be wondering, all right, well, this kind of sucks because uh, we're running it on a background thread. Well, why are we running it on a background thread? Simply because we said, let's take this code and we'll throw it on the queue. And again, the, the this queue can just put it onto any thread it wants. So this is no longer running on the main thread. If it was running on the main thread, right, that means we'd have to wait. And we're obviously not doing that in this example. But we do want to run this code, this particular stuff here, which is our drawing code, on a main thread. Because again, we need to. If we're going to draw something on screen, we need to use the main thread. And we can do this by creating another call. So we could say, in this example, I'm going to use dispatch sync. And again, the, it looks very similar. The queue that we want to run this on is the actual main queue. So we'll say dispatch uh, get, and there's a dispatch get main queue option. So the dispatch get main queue, you can actually read about this right here, says returns the default queue that is bound to the main thread, meaning that any code that is executed on this queue will be executed on the main thread. And that's what we want to happen, right? We want this drawing code to execute on the main thread. So by adding this call in, we're now saying, all right, we'll take this code, and instead of executing it on this queue, we're actually going to execute it on the main queue. All right, that's basically what this is saying. Now, you might be wondering, well, why did you use dispatch sync? Well, in this case, I actually am going to want to wait for this call to be done. And why do I want to wait? Well, because I'm using this self.count variable, and I'll show you a way around this in just a bit, but basically, right, if I just did self.count plus equals 10, and I said dispatch async, then my while loop can actually keep running, and this code might not be run for some period of time after that, right? So if I, if I just kind of ran this code, and uh, I said dispatch async, then the, the block of code would be put on the queue, but it might not execute until the while loop maybe has gone through another two or three times, right? And so this plus equals 10 could actually be at maybe a value of 40 by the time it goes to read this self.count. 
But anyway, that's sort of a minor thing. The important thing about dispatch sync is just that it has to wait until this is executed. So if this code is executing on our, our thread, right, it's gonna hit this dispatch sync call, and then it has to wait until all this code in here is has been executed. All right, but if I go ahead and run this, you'll actually see that I get the result that I wanted, right? I'm loading in all these things asynchronously, right? The button goes away right away. Then I'm basically running the while loop in a background thread. So the background thread is gonna keep going and it's just going to keep reading these resources as it does. I'm going to then execute the drawing code on the main thread. All right, so very nice. That's uh, a very nice thing that we wanted there. Another thing, very important thing that I'm going to show you though is that we can use a capture list or we can copy the value that we get at a particular time into this block. So let's just change this to dis dispatch async for a second and see what we might get as a change in this example. So if we have dispatch async and I start the image fall, you'll notice that the animations are actually a little bit off. They're, they're not the 10 pixels, they're actually 20 pixels off from the original spot. And you'll actually notice that zebra image is now going to cover that last image. So because I'm using dispatch async, the order isn't it isn't deterministic. I can't really determine when this code is going to be run because dispatch async just means we're going to take the block, run it at some later point, and because we're doing that, the self.count value can is is changing underneath us, right? Now, a way around this is we can copy the value of the self.count into our uh, into this block. And this is known as a capture list in Swift. Now I can just say x gets self dot count in. And this is creating a capture list and it's just saying that let's use this x variable and I'm going to take the current value of self dot count and assign it to x. And now in my code I can simply say let's use x instead. And so this will actually work out for us because what we've, we're, we've, we're doing right as we go through this code we increment self dot count now we make a copy of the current value and we're gonna use that value when we actually go to execute it. So by using this, I can actually still use dispatch async and I can run the code. And you see it basically looks the exact same as the first example did when we were using dispatch sync. But the benefit of this is that it's actually running asynchronously and so it's not actually conflicting with uh, the code that's running here. So I can actually just run really this part of the while loop and I just throw this block of code onto another queue that will be run at another point. I don't actually have to wait on this code to be run. So that's actually pretty cool. Now let's change something else up about this. Um, what I wanna change is that this isn't actually gonna be run here. I actually am going to run this so that it runs after I increment this count. And let's see what this does because it's actually a pretty cool effect. So. What I have is I have my dispatch async call and this is going to run in the while loop and the while loop isn't what takes a very long period of time. What takes a long amount of time is this loading in this image, right? This is what takes all the time up. So what we're going to do is we're going to dispatch this code onto a bunch of threads. And this is pretty neat because what we're doing is we're going to load a bunch of images asynchronously so we could actually try and load all these images on maybe three or four different threads right at the same time however many uh, uh, Grand Central Dispatch will please because this queue is a concurrent queue right because it's a concurrent queue it doesn't have to run one thing at a time it can actually run multiple things at the same time and so our while loop right is going to say dispatch this code and then on the next run through it's going to say dispatch this code again and each time we have a little bit of a different value for our self.count. So very cool. Now I'm gonna actually move this uh, capture list up here to this guy up here so that I can actually use the value of X in this example, all right? And by doing that, now I'm actually gonna get the copied value and all the images will actually appear in the right position. So again, I'm just saying self.count, I'll get the current value of the count when I have added this and then it's going to asynchronously dispatch all this stuff. All right, now let's try and run this. And if I do, we can see that we actually get a different effect if we do this. But if we do, you'll notice that all the images actually load in and they load in very fast. You'll notice that they're actually significantly faster at loading in than they did the first time. However, you'll notice that they are out of order, right? And why are they out of order? Well. Basically, we're going in and we dispatch all this work actually quite quickly. But 
maybe uh, you know we've we've added all these image uh, requests on but basically whoever has you know whoever can load the image in the fastest is gonna win so if we're trying to run this code on maybe three or four different threads at the same time right whoever was the fastest one to take all that code in is actually going to be the one who executes it right and so again this is not deterministic so it's not we aren't guaranteed that the order will uh, remain. And so this is a another interesting aspect of Grand Center Dispatch. It may be not what we wanted to accomplish, right? But we could actually load in a bunch of images at a fairly rapid pace. And you can see that you get some variations as you run this each time. But yeah, that's pretty much how Grand Center Dispatch works in a nutshell. Just to kind of wrap everything up, the main uh, ideas are that we have dispatch queues. That is sort of the main design idea behind Grand Central Dispatch. We have these queues, we have concurrent queues, and we have serial queues. Again, concurrent queues mean that we can just keep dispatching work to threads that can accept the work. The serial queue, however, is only going to run one thing at a time. So if we defined a serial queue instead of a concurrent queue, which this queue in particular is a concurrent queue, but we can make our own queues that are actually serial. And a serial queue, though, will only accept one item at, a same, at a time. So it'll only accept one block of code to work on at a time. So those are the two types of queues. The other two things you should be aware of are dispatch async and dispatch uh, sync. So I changed the name here, but dispatch async again means that the code will only run or uh, has to run right on the, uh, or sorry, rather dispatch async means that uh, we don't have to wait for the code to be run, right? So we can just take this code, throw it on a queue, and it'll be executed whenever the queue gets around to it. But the important part is this function returns immediately. It returns right away. If we call dispatch sync, this means that we have to wait until everything that's within this uh, block has been executed, right? So those are the two differences. We have dispatch async, dispatch sync, and we have the two different types of queues. The last and sort of a uh, little nitpicky thing was this capture list that I talked about, which allows us to copy current values in the environment and leave or use those values at a later point in time. So hopefully this tutorial was very beneficial. I know it was very long and uh, probably drawn on for a little bit too long, but hopefully you got a lot out of this tutorial. If you have any questions, feel free to leave your questions in the comments below because I know this can be a little bit of a daunting uh, thing to learn. But again, check out the uh, code from GitHub and it'll be a lot easier to follow along if you just download it from there. All right, I'll see you guys in the next tutorial.